Greville. Twelve Dancing Princesses Retold. A Tale from the Romance, a medieval fairy tale series. Written by Demelza Carlton. Autonerated by A.I. Charlotte from Google. 1. We should have made the wedding this week, Dokia said, lacing her fingers through Vasco's. Waiting eight more days is torture. I call it delicious anticipation, Vasco replied. Besides, if we got married this week, we wouldn't have a house to live in. Tomorrow I'll make a start on the roof, so that when you become my bride, we'll be able to spend our wedding night under a roof. She lifted her gaze to the sky and sighed. Right now, I would be perfectly happy with the stars as my roof, the night I become yours. If I have you, I will have everything I ever wanted. Right up until it rains, Vasco said. Dokia laughed. And that is why you're my lord and provider, or you will be after next week. I cannot think of rain while the sun still shines. Ah, but the sun is setting now. And once the sun is gone, I'll make sure that all you can think about is you and me. Vasco raced into the trees, pulling her along until they reached the clearing they had claimed as their own. Kissing Dokia was like air, he couldn't get enough of her. Their kisses grew more heated, and their clothes began to loosen before they started removing them entirely. Vasco laid her on the soft grass by the stream, where she gazed up at him with eyes full of love. With all the practice we're getting, you will be perfect at this when our wedding night comes, she teased. Only because you are already perfect, my Eudocia, Vasco said, kicking off his boots. Flatterer, she replied, undoing the lacing of her gown to expose most of her chest. What about these? Perfect enough for you? Too perfect for me, Vasco replied. Much like the rest of you. I don't know what madness made you accept me, but before you recover your senses, I will accept anything you offer me. She parted her gown completely, laying herself bare. I offer you everything I am, and everything I have. Take me Vasco. Vasco opened his mouth to respond, but another voice cut in. That's a mighty pretty morsel. Too pretty for some peasant boy. Something crashed into the side of Vasco's head, and he fell lifeless to the grass. He never heard Dokia's screams pierce the air, or those from the village as it burned. When he awoke, there was nothing but silence and death to greet him. For hours he walked the ruins of his home, looking for hope where there was none. So he did what any young man would after everything he had known was dead and buried. He joined the army, figuring that death would find him soon enough. But fate had a different plan for Vasco. 2. Wishing to be the fairest of them all was the worst kind of curse to visit on a princess, Bianca mused. She alone among her sisters had fair hair, so pale that in today's bright sunlight it almost seemed white. It made her stand out, drawing unwanted attention from men and women alike. The men she did not mind so much, for she knew that as a princess she was near untouchable to most of them, but when the queen's gaze landed on her one too many times, nothing good could come of it. That Bianca was the daughter of a minor concubine, a princess in name, but not much more, who outshone the queen's own daughter, only made it worse. So that was why the fairest of all the king's daughters now rode through the unseasonable heat, into exile at the summer palace. A place where the king's virgin daughters would be safe, the queen had said with a vicious smile, until they were married. Bianca knew better. The summer palace was where girls were sent to become old maids. No girl who had ever been sent there had returned, nor had they received word of any fortuitous marriage alliances the girls had made. That in itself was suspicious, Bianca mused. For the proposed marriage between the queen's daughter, Lagel, and the neighboring king, had been trumpeted far and wide. For one horrible moment, Bianca had worried that she would be sent as Lagel's companion to the foreign court, but the queen had taken a dislike to another minor princess instead. So poor Ava could look forward to a lifetime of servitude, while Bianca was granted the relative freedom of exile. Right now though, Bianca almost envied Ava. 
Ava would ride through Shady Forest all the way to her new home, while Bianca's road was just that. A road. A road tramped by thousands of marching feet, when her father's armies had been fighting to claim this place, and it was kept clear to facilitate troop movements should they be needed in future. So the sun beat down mercilessly, with no shelter in sight. Which brought her back to the curse of being the fairest of all the king's daughters. Her cheeks burned, though she had no reason to blush. Bianca had never experienced a sunburn before, but if this was one, she had no desire to experience one again. By the time they reached the edge of a wood and a cottage where she might take shelter, Bianca's face felt like it was on fire. She signaled for her guards to halt, and she dismounted. Praying that the owner of the cottage was home and willing to offer temporary shelter to a traveler, Bianca knocked tentatively at the door. The door creaked open as though she was expected. Princess, an elderly voice croaked. Please come inside. A wrinkled hand beckoned her in. Bianca glanced at her guards, who didn't look concerned, so she accepted the old woman's invitation and followed her into the blessed cool of the cottage. The old woman shuffled to the table where she poured two cups of liquid from a stoppered jug. Then she waved her hand and the door slammed shut. That got Bianca's attention. I am Coon of a witch who guards these lands. Welcome, princess. I take it you're not accustomed to travel? Bianca shook her head, wincing as this only seemed to make her face hurt more. I can give you a salve to soothe that burn if you wish. If you're anything like your sisters, you wish to stay pretty for as long as possible. She gave a gummy grin. I would prefer not to be pretty, Bianca said with regret. Pretty princesses attract unwanted attention. Much better to be unseen. The woman cackled again. An invisible princess, eh? That's quite a trick. Even more impressive than the day when the queen's new gown. Please don't mention that, Bianca groaned. I only wish to see how the queen's new gown was made. I had no idea what was invisible to me, became invisible to everyone else too. My mother banned me from using magic every day after that, so that the queen would not know that it was I who made her gown invisible so that she appeared naked at court. I think she suspects something though. She has never liked me. Kuhn patted Bianca's hand. It matters not. You're far from court and the queen now and your mother too I think. Mayhap you should practice your magic a little more. You never know when it might be useful to become invisible. If Bianca didn't know better, she would think Kuhn knew of her desire to escape. Or perhaps Kuhn knew the truth about life in the Summer Palace. Surely the politics could not be worse than those in the King's harem. But where there were a lot of women. Are there many ladies residing at the Summer Palace? She ventured. Not so many. With you there shall be twelve princesses. All about your age and ripe for marriage. All they need are suitable husbands. Bianca tried to hide her surprise. What new old maids? Were the stories wrong and the girls really would be married off? Or were the old maids taken somewhere else? Here's your salve, Kuhn said. The jar clattered to the table from her shaking hands. You be sure to put some on now, then another coat, morning and night. It should heal without a blemish. Bianca obeyed. The salve seemed to extinguish the flames, though some of the heat remained. Thank you, she said with feeling. You can come visit any time you wish to practice your magic, Kuhn said. Aye. I can leave the palace? To come and visit you? Bianca asked in surprise. Kuhn snorted. It is a palace, child, not a prison. Within the borders, you will be safe. My cottage marks the edge of palace lands, so take care you do not go beyond it. The summer palace has its pleasures, as I'm sure you will find out, once you begin to explore. No doubt your sisters will enlighten you. Her sisters. Bianca swallowed. Half-sisters more like and her rivals, should her father choose to marry one of them off for an alliance. 
Marriage would be her only means of escape, and if the opportunity arose, Bianca intended to take it. Perhaps being the fairest of them all might not be a curse, in this case. 3. When Bianca left Kuhn's cottage, she found her guards had gone. Her mare stood outside where she'd left her, along with the pack horses carrying her belongings, but no one else. When Bianca looked askance at Kuhn, the old woman just grinned. Like I said princess, you are safe here. There is no need for guards, while you are on the grounds of the summer palace. Bianca looked around, nervously. But I do not yet know where the summer palace is, she said. The old woman cackled. Neither did your guards, for none of them have been allowed to go further up the road than my cottage. She eyed Bianca. Simply follow the road. It will lead you to your destination. Is it far? Bianca asked, hating the tremor in her voice. Her instincts told her to turn her horse in the opposite direction, and urge it to a gallop until she was as far away from this place as possible. Less than an hour's ride, I am told. But that depends on just how eager you are to reach the palace. Bianca swallowed. Perhaps Kuhn truly could read her mind. Bianca found that for a less than eager princess, on a tired mount she had no desire to kick into a faster pace than a walk, it was indeed less than an hour before the palace loomed into view. Much smaller than the women's palace in the capital, she would not have called it a palace at all, if not for the decorative stonework that marked it as a noble's residence. Her father's seal on the gate left no question as to her destination. Small though it was, this was the summer palace, and her home for the foreseeable future. But not, she vowed, the rest of her life. Servants ran out to greet her, to take care of her horses and see to her things. None of them dared raise their gaze to meet the eyes of a princess. That was as it should be, Bianca supposed. Then why did she feel such a strong burst of fear from them all? Perhaps she only imagined it. Princess Bianca, I presume? A booming male voice rang out, preceding a richly dressed man who bowed low before her. I am F.A., cousin to the Queen, and the steward of the Summer Palace. The King wouldn't trust anyone less with such treasured jewels from his harem such as yourself and your sisters. A crow cawed loudly with what sounded like laughter as it took flight from the roof above. Bianca drew herself up to her haughtiest height, which sadly fell short of this odious man's shoulder. Nevertheless, she was a princess and the king's daughter, not merely some distant relation of the queen's. No, he would not trust a lesser noble than yourself, she said sweetly. After all, guard duty for a group of women who are used to living a protected life in the palace is hardly a job for someone the king values highly. The steward's nostrils flared. Her barb had indeed landed. I would not expect such a sheltered princess as yourself to know anything of the dangers outside your father's palace in the capital. His vulpine grin said what his words did not, that he hoped Bianca would fall afoul of some of these dangers, for he would enjoy her misfortune. Bianca suppressed a snort, for such things were unladylike. She was no ordinary princess, but let the man believe what he liked. She had learned politics from her very infancy, for no girl survived long in a harem otherwise. Let him do his worst. She would be prepared. Bianca bowed her head to hide her smile. The steward seemed to take this as submission. More fool him. I shall take you to your quarters and to see your sisters. He waved her inside. For a moment, Bianca hesitated on the threshold. Even in the evening light, it seemed much brighter outside the confines of the summer palace. But such fears were silly, she told herself. Taking a deep breath, she strode forward with her head held high. 4. Bianca heard her sisters before she saw them. The sounds of women at dinner when there were no men to command restraint was a familiar song of home. Lesser wives, concubines and their daughters who didn't have the status to be entitled to a private apartment, had shared a common table in the harem. Several tables, as her father prided himself on the sheer number of women under his authority. 
So it was with a smile on her lips that she entered the dining hall, taking a deep breath to greet her sisters. Bianca's gaze swept across their faces and stopped dead. She knew every face but one. The ruddy face of a man beamed at her from under a hat so fluffy and floppy it looked like he wore a dead puppy on his head. If this was to be a new court fashion, Bianca was glad to be well away from it. And who might you be? The strange man slurred, raising a cup of wine to her. Bianca lowered her eyes, but had to force herself not to incline her head. There could only be two men superior to a princess, her husband and the king. As this man was neither, he must be beneath her notice. Her sisters didn't deem his question important enough to answer, either. This is Princess Bianca, Efe said. Only just arrived from the palace. He made her sound like some sort of delectable dish, fresh from the kitchen. Bianca suppressed a shiver. She'd heard children's tales of men who ate human flesh, but surely they were nothing but stories. Yet the way Efe spoke. You must sit beside me, princess, and tell me about your father's court, the man said. As if by magic, her sisters slid up the bench to make space for her. For a moment she hesitated, wondering what they knew about the stranger that she did not, but she could hardly ask them in front of the man. Better to ask him to talk about himself. Her mother and the other concubines had often said it was a man's favorite conversation topic, for the more he talked about himself, the more he liked the lady who pretended to listen. But Bianca did not need to pretend. I would much rather hear about you, sir. We hear little of the adventures to be had in the world outside my father's harem. The women's palace shelters us from such things. But you, I am sure, have traveled very far. How did you come here? He laughed so hard he spat out his wine. By horse, of course. It isn't how I came here that matters, but why? Do you know why I am here, pretty princess? Bianca recognized the lust in his eyes. She lowered her gaze and shook her head. I am just arrived, so I have not yet heard, sir. I am here to get myself a wife and a palace, he announced, grinning. The grin vanished when he reached for his wine, only to find Brenna's little dog lapping at the cup. Wretched creature, he shouted. The dog took fright and galloped across the table to seek refuge under Brenna's chair. What appetite Bianca had possessed now vanished at the sight of dog footprints in every remaining platter of food. She waited for a maidservant to remove the tainted dishes, as would happen in the women's palace in the capital, but no one moved except the man beside her, who seized another chicken leg. More wine, he called, raising his cup. And a fresh cup to drink it from. To Bianca's surprise, Hazel rose from her seat. I will fetch it, she said, and headed out of the hall. You make my decision a difficult one, the man said. Which of you will be my wife? If I can only have one of you, should I choose the prettiest, or the most obedient? Silence reigned at the table, broken only by the sound of mastication. No one laughed at his attempted jest and none of them deigned to reply. Was that because they'd given up on the chance of escape from this life? Bianca refused to give up, so she seized her chance. You should choose the fairest, sir, the one who will best please you. She lowered her gaze and batted her eyelashes, as she'd seen the maids do to the handsome guards, when they thought no one else was looking. She felt like a complete fool, until she realized it had worked. You're as wise as you are beautiful Princess Bianca, the man said. I think you will please me very well. Triumph welled up in her breast, but she did her best to hide it. I hope so, sir. Hazel returned with a goblet of wine, which she presented to the man. He drank it off in three huge gulps, then flashed a red-lipped smile at Hazel. Thank you, my dear. Bianca held her breath, but she caught the sneer that curled Hazel's lips. Hazel didn't want him for a husband. He'd evidently caught her look of distaste, too. But I think Princess Bianca is prettier than you. If she were to fetch me more wine, I think she will capture my heart completely. I will show her where to find it then. Bianca? 
Hazel jerked her head imperiously toward the door. From princess to serving wench? Bianca balked at the thought, but she could do worse things to catch a husband and secure her escape from exile. Resignedly, she rose from the bench and followed Hazel out. Good girl, the man slurred behind her. Bianca gritted her teeth. She would pay a high price for her escape if she were to marry that fool, whoever he was. But weren't all men fools? 5. Bianca followed Hazel through the house to the wine cellar, which she was surprised to find appeared bigger than the house above. It wasn't until they were deep between the dusty barrels that Hazel spoke. You're wasting your time with that one, she said. Like all the others, he'll be gone in three days. Others? Bianca asked, her mind whirling. The thought of better men to choose from was certainly appealing. Hazel grinned. Oh, so many others. The promise of a palace and a princess's hand in marriage is quite the prize to a penniless adventurer, which most of them are. Dear cousin F.A. dresses them up in fancy clothes, but if you look closely, you can see how poorly they fit. Borrowed finery instead of the patched rags they arrive in, so that we allow them to sit at our table, but they will learn no secrets from us. She pointed at a barrel. This is the one. This wine is stronger than anything you have ever tasted, which is why we don't. It's for men only, cousin F.A. says, which is fine by us. Here, look at the mark. She wrapped her knuckle against the barrel below a blackened smudge. Bianca squinted at it. Now she looked more closely, she realized it was a brand, applied several times to the same barrel or just once by a particularly unsteady hand, belonging to a man who'd perhaps drunk too much of his own wine. Is it a bird of some kind? Hazel nodded. This comes specially from somewhere far to the west. It's F.A.'s private supply, which is why we give it to his guests. She took a jug and proceeded to fill it from the barrel. Why didn't he dine with us tonight? Bianca asked. Surely the Queen's cousin would take every opportunity to dine with princesses, if only to make himself feel important. Hazel laughed. Oh, he wouldn't stoop to eat with us. We're the Queen's hostages to our mother's good behavior. Anyone too pretty or too clever, or even anyone who catches our father's eye for too long, wins up here. For if another wife's daughters marry better than hers, she might lose her place as principal wife and queen. Perhaps that's why he forces us to share meals with beggars and soldiers of fortune, in the hope that we're silly enough to marry them. Disgraced daughters, disgraced mothers, that would only serve to cement her power in the capital. Considering the idea, Bianca shook her head. More likely she intends to leave us here to rot in spinsterhood, for any children we might have would still possess royal blood, no matter who their father was. But why would that man tonight think he had a chance to marry one of us, if he is a beggar? Hazel winked. Delusions of grandeur, I'm sure. He believes he is better than any man before him, so he will be the one to solve the mystery, winning a bride and lands that he does not deserve. I have not heard of any mystery here. That's because it's no mystery to us. Bianca opened her mouth to insist that it most definitely was a mystery to her, then closed it again as Hazel leaned in closer. Wait and see. Brenna has a plan that will confound even the Queen. We are the King's daughters and we will not be held prisoner against our will. Not even F.A. and a whole army of beggars will stop us. With another wink, Hazel led the way up the steps to the palace proper, carrying the jug of wine. 6. Several hours later, when Bianca could barely keep her eyes open, she was startled into alertness by the clatter of metal at her feet. She peered under the table. A sword still in its scabbard, attached to an unbuckled sword belt, lay on the flagstones. A snore cut through the air like a rusty saw, before something clunked to the table beside her. Bianca bumped her head painfully in her haste to see what it was this time. The man at her side had fallen face first onto the table, and the snoring came from him. Finally, Brenna said, rising. 
The other girls followed her example, and Bianca struggled to her feet. Bianca swayed, exhaustion conquering her as surely as it had the unknown man. The unknown boring man she would sooner die than marry, she knew now. I'm going to bed, Bianca mumbled, stumbling in the direction she vaguely remembered led to the bedchamber she'd share with her sisters. But you must come dancing with us, one of the other girls said. Another night, she managed to say. Let her rest, she heard Hazel say as someone took her arm, leading her. She's been traveling all day. Tomorrow she can dance. Dance? Bianca could do many things, but dancing wasn't one of them. Grace was not one of her virtues. She opened her mouth to say so, but all that came out was an unintelligible yawn, followed by another one. Somehow, she found herself on a soft surface. A bed she hoped, but she was too tired to care as sleep enticed her into a dream where dogs drank wine, beggars wore silk and princesses served their every whim as crows cawed from the heavens. 7. Waking in a darkened room where the only sound was the even breathing of what Bianca thought must be a dozen sleepers, disoriented her at first. She had never shared a sleeping chamber before, and the tiny cubicle that had been hers in the capital had always glowed with the first light of dawn. Groggily, she rolled out of bed, dressed and padded to the door. As she reached to push it open, Bianca nearly tripped over something on the floor. She caught herself in time and shoved the door open to let in enough light to investigate the obstacle. Bianca almost laughed at what appeared to be a pile of worn-out dancing slippers, so hard used the soles bore huge holes. They'd been piled artfully in a drift just inside the door, where anyone trying to enter or exit the room would certainly trip over them and wake everyone. Bianca surveyed the room, but by some magic, she hadn't woken any of her sisters. Pushing the door open wider, she stepped out of the room and found the reason for her sister's makeshift security measures. The adventurer who'd been sleeping on the table last night, now lay snoring on a pallet beside the entrance to their room. Wondering whether he was supposed to be a guard, or if he intended to waylay one of the girls when they emerged from their chamber, Bianca did her best to be quiet as she crossed the room and made her way to the dining hall. The empty table bore no signs of last night's meal or anything with which to break her fast. Which was strange, given the sun showed it was mid-morning at least. In the women's palace at the capital, the benches would be full of minor wives, concubines and princesses, gossiping like the brightly coloured birds they resembled, as they tried to work out who was missing and hence who the king had favoured to share his bed the previous night. For it was common knowledge in the harem that he and the queen had not shared a bed, since she bore his son and heir. But there would be no such gossip here. The girls all shared a room and would continue to do so until they died old maids. Unloved, untouched and unwanted. It was no surprise Brenna had brought her little dog along. It was a wonder no one else had pets. If she was forced to live in exile here for the rest of her days, Bianca might consider getting one. A cat perhaps. She found her way to the kitchen, where it sounded like the household servants were having their breakfast. Anyone willing to place a wager on the latest one? Bianca heard one girl ask. A loud snort silenced the rest of them. That one? Guzzled his wine down like he'd never tasted it before. Probably hadn't. No one will solve the mystery, least of all these adventurers who keep showing up. When it was princes and such, maybe they had a chance, but these men? I wouldn't trust them anywhere near my daughters, and I don't know why the king does. Someone made hushing sounds. Don't talk treason. You never know who's listening. The woman wouldn't be silenced. It's no treason to speak the truth. I don't know why the king does what he does. But if he's so desperate to see this mystery solved, seems to me he'd only have to question the girls. Not send in some stranger to investigate for him. It sounds like something out of a story, from someone with too much imagination. Next thing you know there'll be witches and curses and magical gifts, and someone will fall in love. You'd better hope none of the princesses falls in love with one of those men. 
The king would never let one of his daughters marry a nobody. A clatter told Bianca they were clearing the table. But he wouldn't be a nobody anymore if he solves the mystery, will he? Even if the man is a beggar, he'd become master of this house. Yes, but if they were to fall in love before he solved the mystery. Someone laughed. Then he'd better solve the mystery or lose his love. Dying to ask more about this mystery, but not wishing them to know what she'd overheard, Bianca scuffed her feet deliberately along the flagstones before she entered the kitchen. She found all eyes on her for a stunned moment before they were lowered in respect. Your Highness, a woman murmured, and the rest chorused something similar. I've recently arrived, Bianca began, so I don't know when or where meals are served here. I fear that I have missed breakfast, yet I am so hungry. I'll fetch you something directly, Your Highness, the girl said, bobbing in such a way that Bianca wasn't sure if she was trying to bow or curtsy. Both, maybe. Where would you like to be served? Bianca was stunned into silence for a moment. Never before had she been given a choice in such a thing. A minor princess ate at the common table in the harem, sitting in a spot designated by her rank. For the first time in her life, Bianca was her own mistress. The freedom both frightened and exhilarated her. I will eat in the hall where we dined last night, she said breathlessly. As if reading her thoughts, the girl bobbed again and replied, As you wish, mistress. Bianca managed a nod in response before she left the kitchen. Her feet felt strangely light, as though she walked on air. Free. She was free of the miasma of politics she'd lived with so long in the harem. Perhaps she could even. She returned to the kitchen. Once I am finished eating, have someone saddle my horse. I wish to ride. Bianca half expected someone to tell her she couldn't, or caution her against leaving the palace, but the only reply she relieved was a colorless, yes mistress, from one of the people bustling about. An hour later, when she sat astride the same horse she'd ridden yesterday, Bianca could barely believe it. No one came out to stop her. Why, she could kick the mare into a gallop and leave all this behind forever if she chose. For a moment Bianca was tempted, but she resisted. She knew little of the world outside the walls of the palace. There could be wild animals or anything out there. But Kuhn had said she was safe inside the palace estate. Kuhn. She would ride for Kuhn's cottage and visit the old woman. Perhaps even practice a little magic while she was there. After all, she was free to do as she wished now. Bianca urged the horse into a comfortable pace, feeling a smile light up her face more brightly than the morning sun. Who knew exile would feel so good? 8. Vasco's stomach growled, reminding him that it has been many hours since he had eaten his last crust of bread. The incessant hunger pangs were almost enough to make him forget the pain in his knee. In battle, he had scarcely felt the prick of the arrow as it worked its way between his armor, so it was a cruel twist of fate indeed that with every step he took, he had to grit his teeth as pain pierced his knee again and again. Such a small wound had yet made him unfit for war, so his commanding officer had kindly chosen to send him home. For a married man, or one with any family at all, this would be a blessing. For Vasco, whose entire family had been slaughtered before his village was burned to the ground by the enemy, it was the worst kind of curse. No home, no family, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Vengeance had spurred him to join the army in the first place, but he lost his taste for violence as quickly as it had come. It was too late to protect those he had lost. No matter how many lives he took, he could not bring them back. So he had learned to fight for families and homes that were not his own. If he could save just one village or someone's parents and brothers and sisters, someone's wife and children, so that no one else had to endure the emptiness inside that ate at him every day, perhaps Vasco would understand why his life had been spared. Now, understanding eluded him. He had killed and he had survived, but a single arrow had ended his purpose. So he wandered, doing whatever work he could to earn enough to eat, 
and sometimes even a place to sleep at night. Or he could, if he saw another soul he could ask for work. These woods he'd wandered into confounded him. The road stretched empty before and behind him, and he had not seen even a single dwelling for two days. If he did not find somewhere soon, he would have to hunt for food. Vasco's lips curled with distaste at the thought of having to use his bow. He was a foot soldier, not an archer, but fate seemed to wish it otherwise. A hundred steps he promised himself. He would walk a hundred more steps, and if he did not see any sign of civilization, he would attempt to make camp and hunt for something for dinner. Even if it involved 10, 11, 12, archery. He grimaced. He counted 47 steps as he rounded a bend, but the forest hugged the road as happily as before. At 79, climbing a rise in the road, he almost considered changing it to 200 steps or maybe even three. But the pain in his knee was growing insistent. He needed to stop, and soon. Sighing, Vasco topped the rise. And stopped. At first he only saw one house tucked between the trees. But as his eyes adjusted, he realized he wasn't looking at an isolated cottage in the woods, but enough of them to count as a town. The trees had been thinned to allow space for the houses, but they still towered above them, hiding the place from watchful eyes as they kept their secrets. Though what sort of watchful eye could spy on a village from the very sky itself, Vasco did not know. In fact, he almost laughed at himself for entertaining such a strange notion. Eyes in the sky indeed. Why they would have to belong to birds. Concluding that hunger had scrambled his wits, Vasco resolved to deal with that first. As was his custom when arriving at a new place, he first took stock of the businesses. After all, a thriving business was more likely to have work for him than a humble cottage. He might be lame, jobless and homeless, but Vasco was too proud to beg. As long as he could work to pay for a meal, he was not yet worthless. He squinted at the first shop sign. It showed a garish colored woman's shoe that no woman he'd ever met could afford. Only a queen or perhaps a princess would wear something in such a bright shade of purple. But it might tempt a woman who had heard too many fairy tales and dreamed of one day being a queen. She might then choose to enter the shop so that the shoemaker might grant her a smaller dream, that of a new pair of shoes. Perhaps it was not as silly a sign as he'd thought. And a clever shoemaker who could turn a fine profit might have need of a hard worker and the wherewithal to pay him. This was as good a bet as any. Vasco pushed open the door and stepped inside. A bell tinkled, announcing his presence before he could open his mouth. You are early sir, a voice said. A man appeared in a doorway behind the counter, his eyes widening when he caught sight of Vasco. You are not one of the palace servants, unless the king has spent so much money on shoes that he can no longer clothe his servants in proper livery. He laughed as if this was some sort of joke. Vasco's voice was grave. I served the king as a faithful soldier, until my superiors said the wounds I had received in battle made me unfit to fight any more. He spread his hands wide. Now I ask if you have any work I might do, so that I might earn a meal and perhaps a bed for the night, to help me make my way home. Vasco did not say that he no longer had a home. He had already learned that it was unwise to mention the possibility of staying in a village, where he was a stranger. Better to earn a place through hard work and then be invited to stay. His village had been no different. His heart tightened in his chest. At least it had been. Now there was no one left but strangers. For all his own people were dead. The shoemaker squinted at him. A soldier, eh? Have you any experience in making shoes? Vasco shook his head. I wear shoes but the making of them is a mystery to me. He managed a faint smile. The shoemaker sighed. Then you are out of luck, wounded soldier. I could do with a skilled assistant, for I am busier than I ever believed possible. But I have no time to train an apprentice, especially one who has never shown any interest or aptitude for making ladies' shoes. Vasco bowed his head. I understand, he said. 
Would you know of any other business in town who might be able to offer me a day's work? He did not let desperation color his tone yet. After all, he had gone longer without food before. The shopkeeper grimaced. If this were any other town, you would have more luck. But this is Slipper Town, and our trade is shoes for the palace. If you're not a shoemaker, there is no work for you here. A whole town of shoemakers? Vasco found that hard to believe. In the capital perhaps, but out here, in the middle of the woods? Who buys so many shoes? Vasco demanded. The king of course, the shopkeeper replied cheerfully. He has many wives and many daughters. And each must have shoes befitting a lady of the court. Vasco frowned. But the court is far from here, surely. The shopkeeper chuckled. Ah, but the summer palace is very close. And the princesses there need more shoes than the rest of the court put together. He winked as though they shared a secret. A secret Vasco did not know, but what cared he for princesses? He was a lowly soldier, who would never be allowed to catch a glimpse of such a high lady. He would happily live and die with no knowledge of such strange creatures. There was but one woman he wished to see again, but as long as he lived, he would only see her in his dreams. She had perished along with the rest of his village. The shopkeeper's voice broke through his reverie. Perhaps you should ask at the palace. The shopkeeper coughed. With so many of the king's precious daughters in residence, the palace is surely in need of more guards. Vasco thanked him for his advice and asked for directions to the palace. Vasco was surprised to hear that it was but an hour or two's travel from the village, he could reach the palace by nightfall. Thanking the man once more, Vasco returned to the road. From the array of signs showing similarly brightly colored slippers, he realized the truth of the shoemaker's words. This was indeed Slipper Town. A town of shoemakers and little else. The palace must be large indeed, with hundreds of female residents to keep so many tradesmen in business perhaps even large enough to offer him a bed and meals for the rest of his life. He set off up the road, a new spring in his step for the first time. For deep in his heart, Vasco felt the stirrings of hope. 9. Bianca settled into a new routine quickly. She woke with the dawn, while her sister slept on until well past noon. After breaking her fast, she rode or walked to Coon's cottage. On her return, she would walk beside the lake. Some days it was mirror calm, reflecting the sky and birds above, as though there were a second world below, if she but had the courage to pierce the surface. On other days, the beach vanished beneath an onslaught of waves blown up by the slightest breeze, and the lake licked at the very foundations of the summer palace. She grew more skilled at making things invisible. She'd managed to vanish most things in Coon's cottage, before making them visible again. Today, Coon had insisted she bespell the cottage roof. Except she was not to make it vanish entirely, oh no. Coon asked her to vanish patches of it so that there appeared to be holes in the roof, yet anyone looking through those holes would see nothing of what went on within her house. The strange twist on her invisibility spell had made Bianca work harder at her magic than ever before. She'd felt worn out by the time she'd accomplished it, only to find Coon demanding proof that the spell had worked. That meant climbing on the cottage roof and peering in. Bianca had protested at first, after all princesses did not climb on roofs. Her mother would be horrified at the very thought, but Coon was adamant that one of them must, and the old woman was hardly spry enough to make the climb. Bianca managed to hoist herself onto the water butt and scramble onto the roof without too much trouble, but climbing down had been her undoing. She'd hit the lid of the water butt on the way down wrong so that it tilted, and instead of landing firmly on it with both feet, she'd slid into the cold water. The butt was easily as deep as she was tall, Bianca might have drowned had Coon not witnessed her fall. As it was, the woman had reached in, seized her collar, and dragged the spluttering princess to the surface where she could breathe again. While Bianca's clothes dried in the sun, she sat in her shift before the fire, with a scalding cup of tea in her hands to ward off the chill from her immersion. 
Kuhn didn't ask her to perform any more magic, so Bianca decided it was her turn to do the asking today. What is this mystery in the palace everyone keeps talking about? Bianca said, blowing on her tea to cool it. Do you mean the shoes? Kuhn asked as she poured herself some tea. The shoes were no mystery, Bianca was sure of it. The other girls piled them up to keep adventurers out of their sleeping chamber, for she'd counted at least half a dozen different men who'd come and gone. They shared the princess's table and slept on a pallet outside their door for three nights before they disappeared, never to return. More than once, Bianca had wondered whether the men were some sort of illusion she'd conjured to keep her hopes alive of finding a husband and a way out of exile, but she knew the men were real. The first adventurer, who dropped his sword beneath the table on her first night in the summer palace, had neglected to retrieve it. Bianca had found the sword, scabbard and belt several days after his departure, half hidden under the bench where he'd sat. She'd carried it all to her bedchamber and concealed the items under her bed. The sharp steel was real enough, so the sword's bearer must have been real too. As were all the adventurers who claimed to be able to solve the mystery. A mystery so mysterious even Bianca didn't know what it was. I don't know. The mystery that draws men to the palace like flies to honey, Bianca said finally. I know men are fools when faced with a beautiful woman, we learned that with our first breath in my father's harem, but they seem taken, dot nay, obsessed with the notion that they can solve some mystery and claim one of us as a wife. It's not just um either. The servants say the same. Whoever solves the mystery will become master of the summer palace and marry one of us. If I have to make myself invisible to avoid it, I swear his bride will not be me. She meant it too, Bianca realized. She would not trade her freedom in exile for marriage to some lusty brute she barely knew. The choice may not be up to you, Kuhn chided. If the king offers a man a princess for a bride, he might also offer the man his choice of his daughters. Bianca shuddered. To be given away as a prize instead of a marriage alliance, as though she were a possession instead of a person, it chilled her. Her father was many things both bad and good, but he was fiercely protective of his family. What would make my father offer his own flesh and blood as a prize to any man? Kuhn grinned gummily. Have you noticed anything unusual about the shoes? They are worn out, Bianca replied. My sisters pile up their worn-out dancing shoes on the threshold to our sleeping chamber, to trip the unwary adventurer if he seeks to enter without our permission. Permission that would never be granted, she was certain of it. So they do, and every morning a maid comes to tidy away the broken shoes. She throws them on the refuse heap and brings new shoes for each princess. Yet the next morning there are more broken shoes. Kuhn drank deeply from her teacup. How do you explain this? It was on the tip of Bianca's tongue to say that her sisters must have quite a store of broken shoes, or they retrieved them every night from the refuse heap. But that could not be. None of them would soil themselves by setting foot anywhere near the refuse heap, especially not to claim some old shoes. Instead she said, I can't. And nor can the king or any of the adventurers who hear of this mystery. That is why the king has offered the summer palace and the hand of a princess in marriage to any man who can solve the mystery for him. Kuhn set her empty cup on the table. Bianca still didn't understand. All that because of some shoes? Kuhn shook her head slowly. Not just some shoes. A dozen pairs of dancing shoes every night. Fine shoes suitable for a princess. Why it would take a dozen craftsmen more than a day to make such shoes. And all the silk and leather that must be used to make them. Dot why, you and your sisters will bankrupt the treasury if this keeps on much longer. What else can your father do but offer a reward to anyone who can find him a solution before you and your sisters run his treasury dry? I have not had a single pair of new shoes since I arrived, Bianca objected. Nor have I worn any out. My father cannot blame me for whatever it is my sisters do. I will not be punished for their carelessness. 
She rose and stormed outside to where her clothes were almost dry. She dressed quickly, ignoring the way the still damp cloth clung to her. It would surely dry on the ride home. With a curt farewell to Kuhn, Bianca spurred her horse toward the summer palace. Not all women see marriage as a punishment, Kuhn called softly after her. If you marry a good man, what feels like duty at first can be a pleasure in time. The horse snorted, echoing Bianca's sentiments. She might have lived a sheltered life, but she'd lived in a harem. A harem full of wives who spoke little of the pleasures of marriage. If a woman wanted pleasure of any kind, she must make it for herself. The pleasure of a refreshing ride, or a brisk walk by the lake. Such were the pleasures available to her now, and Bianca found very little enjoyment in Kuhn's company if the old woman intended to harp on about duty. Instead, she would ask her sisters to let her know their secret, and protect it so fiercely no man would pry it from her. For if no man solved the mystery, no man could marry one of them. It was the perfect solution. 10. After an hour's journey up the road, with no signs of the palace or even a break in the woods, Vasco was ready to curse the shoemaker into oblivion for his poor directions. But he reasoned his steps were slower than most, what with his limp and all, so perhaps the shoemaker's directions were for a fitter man than he. Or the palace was as well hidden as the village. Neither would have surprised him, so he trudged wearily on. This time, when he saw a cottage, he paused to scan the woods for the rest of the village. However, this cottage truly did stand alone. From its falling down state, he doubted anyone lived there now. But an empty cottage that no one lived in was a place he could happily spend the night. Nevertheless, the door to this cottage stood shut, so he knocked tentatively on it instead of barging inside. To his surprise, a querulous elderly voice said, Who is it? Vasco wet his lips, suddenly nervous. My name is Vasco, he said. I am a wounded soldier, recently returned from war. I seek a meal and perhaps a bed for the night, and in exchange, I offer my services. He eyed the holes in the roof. For instance, I could fix your roof so that the next time it rains, it no longer leaks. The door creaked open and a wrinkled face peered out. Fixing my roof is no small job, she said. You would need a place to sleep for more than one night, and you'd more than earn your meals between. Vasco smiled at the old woman. Honored grandmother, we have a deal. She eyed him suspiciously. I'm not your grandmother, boy. I'd remember a strapping soldier like you. You can call me Coon. She gave him another hard look before she added, and you can sleep in the barn with the goats. She cackled. For I've no use for a handsome soldier in my bed. Not at my age. Vasco smiled wistfully, for now, she reminded him of his own grandmother. She had not lived to see her village slaughtered. You must have few visitors if you think me handsome. And I have better luck with goats than women, so the barn is a good place for me. After all, three goats had survived the massacre of his village. Three goats and one man but no women. Goat's milk had kept him alive long enough to join the army, when he traded them for the price of his weapons and armor. None of them had been his family's goats, but he had reasoned that the spirits of the slain would have happily handed over their last livestock in order to exact vengeance from their murderers. Perhaps it would help their spirits rest. For Vasco knew it would be a long time before he would know a good night's rest. Come in then, Kuhn said, stepping back and holding the door wide open. There is soup in the pot, and fresh straw in the barn. It will be dark soon, and repairs can wait until morning. Gratefully, Vasco stepped into the dark cottage, his stomach rumbling so loudly at the first whiff of soup that he hardly heard the door slam shut behind him. 11. It was not to be, Bianca found when she reached home. Her sisters were already in the dining hall, studiously ignoring a new adventurer, whose eye-watering pink robe fit so badly Bianca wondered whether F.A. was trying to blind them. The new man was well into his cups when his eyes fixed on her. Well, aren't you a pretty one, he slurred. 
Mayhap I'll take you to wife, so I can see if you're as pale under that robe as you are above it. Bianca was too tired to be courteous to this buffoon. I assure you I am not. Beneath this robe, I'm covered in thick fur like one of the bears from the mountains. I must shave my face every morning to stop the fur from growing. And cut my claws, lest I disembowel someone by mistake. She curled her fingers into claws and bared her teeth. Hazel choked on her soup. Aruna had to pound her on the back as a coughing fit engulfed her, effectively ending the conversation for several minutes. When she thought no one was looking, Brenna set her dog on the table, who scampered straight for the man's goblet. Bianca had to smother a laugh, for this wasn't the first time she'd seen Brenna set the dog on their unwanted dinner guests. She was certain her sister had trained the animal to only drink from a man's cup. Or perhaps he only drank wine, for all her sister's cups contained water tonight. Cursed creature. With a backhand blow, he sent the little, yelping dog flying off the table to hit the wall. It slid to the floor, looking stunned, before it crawled under the table to hide from the horrible man. I shall fetch you some fresh wine, Bianca said through gritted teeth, wishing she could slip poison into the cup. No man who hurt a helpless animal so deserved to live, let alone marry. What if he treated his wife that way? She swept out of the room before he could say anything more. Bianca considered heading to her bedchamber for the sword beneath her bed, but she dismissed the idea almost as soon as she'd thought of it. She'd never handled a sword and with his greater strength, he would easily beat her in a fight. Women didn't wield swords anyway. They fetched wine and waited for the fool to fall asleep. The jug she carried back was so full a little slopped over the brim at every step, but grim determination drove her. Bianca would do her best to get the man to drink himself to death, before he could do the dog further injury. She filled his cup and filled it again until the jug was empty. To her chagrin, he seemed no closer to succumbing to sleep than he had earlier. Yet her own eyes felt heavy, what with all the climbing and spellcasting she'd done at Coons today. Bianca rose unsteadily to her feet. More wine, she muttered, stumbling a little as she headed for the door. Hazel appeared at her elbow. Let me help you sister, she said, prying the jug from Bianca's fingers. Bianca gratefully accepted the other girl's arm. I went for a long ride today. Too long I think. So tired, she yawned. Hazel glanced back at the dining hall. His boasting is enough to put anyone to sleep. Retire early. I'll fetch the wine and make your excuses. She gave Bianca a push in the direction of their sleeping chamber. Bianca nodded and did as she was bidden. It wasn't until she was tucked in her bed that she remembered wanting to ask her sisters about the mystery. Ah, it would wait until morning. It wasn't like the mystery was going anywhere. They'd want a huge pile of shoes to guard against tonight's buffoon. She drifted off into dreamless sleep. 12. As Vasco slid from the roof, he tried to think of a way to tell Coon that she was lucky her house hadn't fallen down around her ears. Yet. But he was a soldier, not a diplomat. Well? Coon demanded, her hands on her hips. Vasco blew out a breath. You were right, he said heavily. The roof doesn't need repairing as much as it needs replacing completely. I think some of the beams are rotten too. I noticed last night that one of the barn walls has a definite lean to it, though the roof is in better repair. If it rains, my bed with the goats might be drier than yours here in the house. Her eyes were shrewd as she regarded him. So how long do you propose to squash my straw and eat my larder bear, soldier boy? Vasco looked her in the eye. As long as you have work you wish me to do, ma'am. He coughed. But the repairs to your roof and the barn will likely take a week or two, depending on how long it takes me to find good timber. Coon waved at the woods around. There are trees aplenty, boy. Take your pick. He nodded. A week then. 
A week's work for just room and board? Surely you will ask for more than that, she said. Vasco spread his arms wide. It is all I ask, he said carefully. But if you choose to gift me with something more, I will not refuse. She nodded slowly. Very well. A bed, board and a gift to match how good a job you do. We have a deal, though you are a fool to accept it. He shrugged. We are all foolish at some point in our lives. But no more foolish than necessary. Which is why I think I shall spend the morning chopping firewood for you before I take your axe into the woods, for a hard worker deserves a hot meal at the end of the day. That soup you made last night was the best I've ever tasted. Flatterer, Coon scoffed. I'll wager your mother makes better. Alas, my mother roams the spirit world now. She has no need for soup, not that she ever did. My father hated the stuff, so she never made it. Vasco bowed his head briefly before turning away and making his way toward the chopping block. If his eyes seemed watery and he had to blink back what felt suspiciously like tears, no one would see. He swung the axe a little harder than necessary, but he told himself that Coon needed kindling as much as big logs to burn the night through. He could no longer cut down his enemies, but a few trees would fall to his frustration before the day was out. The skin of his back crawled as if someone was watching him, but Vasco ignored it. It was probably only Coon, not some enemy who would attack him. Right now his only enemy was wood, and he was more than a match for it. 13. When day dawned, Bianca stepped over the pile of shoes without a second thought. She tiptoed past the snoring adventurer and made her way to the dining hall where she knew breakfast would be served for her. While she ate, the kitchen staff prepared a basket of provisions for her to take on her ride. Usually she gave most of it to Kuhn in thanks for the woman's time training her, for there was far too much for one person, but Bianca wondered what the staff would say if she returned with a basket that wasn't empty. They might send less food with her on the morrow she decided, which would not do. She had no other way of repaying Kuhn. So, though it was the last place she wanted to go after Coon's comments yesterday, she guided her horse along the road to the old woman's house. The sound of an axe biting into wood stopped her before she reached the cottage. Tethering her horse to a tree out of sight of the road, Bianca paused for only a moment to render herself invisible before she continued on foot. It was probably some villager looking for some healing herbs or a good luck charm from Coon. It wasn't the first time Bianca had arrived when Kuhn had a customer, so she was content to wait until the man was gone. A princess shouldn't speak to the villagers, especially not the men. For the adventurers F.A. set at their table were coarse enough, under the thin veneer of good manners they assumed, but a peasant who had no need to pretend to be polite might do anything. Bianca's invisibility might protect her somewhat, but it did nothing to hide the sound she made or her scent if the man had a dog. And if he were to bump into her, Dot, but he wouldn't get close enough for that, Bianca resolved as she crept closer. She skirted Coon's cottage, heading to the yard where she knew the chopping block stood. The man wielding the axe was no villager though. Unless he was the blacksmith. She'd never seen so much muscle on a man, and there was plenty to see, for he was naked to the waist, with sweat gleaming on his broad chest. A scarred chest, she noted. If he wasn't a smith, then he had fought battles against men instead of metal. Or some horrible accident had befallen him. The way he hammered the axe into the hapless chunks of wood spoke of some personal grudge he held against the tree. A section of trunk turned to kindling under his relentless strokes. He swept the spars up in his arms, stacked them in the woodshed, then grabbed another log to dismember. Whoever he was, he showed no sign of slowing. He must have asked for a really complicated spell from Kuhn, to do so much work in payment. Bianca settled on the grass to wait. Hours passed, but he did not slow. If anything, the furrows in his forehead only deepened as he continued to work. He allowed the timber to break into bigger pieces than kindling now, before he stacked them in the woodshed, too. 
He circled the chopping block, giving Bianca a clear view of his equally well-muscled back. He had fewer scars here, though they weren't entirely absent. What did that mean? That when he fought, he faced his enemy head-on, and never turned his back on them? Bianca felt the most peculiar urge to ask him. She could return to the road, dismiss her invisibility spell, and stroll into the yard as though she'd just arrived. She could offer him some of her provisions and introduce herself as Bianca. Not a princess, just a maid from the palace. There. That would do. She rose to her feet, determined to put her plan into action. You've been working hard. You must be hungry. Come inside. The noon meal is ready, Kuhn said. The woodcutter swiped his arm across his face, then grabbed a tunic he'd hung on the edge of the woodshed roof and pulled the garment over his head, hiding those delicious muscles from sight. Delicious? Bianca scoffed at herself for having such thoughts. Why would she want to lick the man's sweaty skin? It would be hard and salty and definitely unpleasant, she told herself. She was just hungry, that was all. She rose, stretching the cramps from her legs from sitting so long, before heading back to the road in search of her horse. The mare stood exactly where she'd been left, with no sign of distress at being invisible. Bianca could see her of course, as she could with anything she bespelled, but if she concentrated, she could also see what everyone else saw, nothing. She grabbed the first thing she touched in the basket, and bit into it. The sweetness told her it was fruit, but that's all the attention she paid to food. Her thoughts were with the scarred man in Coon's cottage. Who was he? 14. With every limping step, Vasco reminded himself how much he hated archery. This hadn't always been the case of course, for archery practice had been a required part of his training. He'd even been good at it once. Now though, he hadn't been able to bring himself to fire an arrow at the enemy since he'd been wounded. Shooting someone from a distance was cowardly, especially if you couldn't give them a clean death. If they fell before you and you had a sword or an axe, it was a simple matter to deliver another blow if the first hadn't killed them. With arrows though, it was much harder to hit someone who'd fallen. And no man, friend or foe, deserved to live with the constant pain he did. Wounds either healed or they killed you. They weren't supposed to torment you for the rest of your life. Yet he nailed the slice of tree trunk to a tree on the edge of Coon's yard, and it became an archery target. Because while he might never shoot another man, he would undoubtedly need to hunt for his dinner one day. If he could not shoot something for the pot, then he would go hungry. Besides, archery practice had always been his favorite part of army training. His thoughts grew clear and singular, focused only on the target and the conditions that might affect his shot. As if carried by a breeze from the distant past, he thought he heard the bark of some long-dead training officer shouting the drill, stance, knock, draw, aim, loose, all followed by a bellowed, again. Vasco marched to the other end of the yard in the pre-dawn light and began to string his bow. He would shoot until he lost or broke all his arrows, or until Kuhn woke and he could start work on her cottage for the day. Stance. He positioned one foot, then the other, ready to move and fire in any direction. Knock. He'd seen men argue over the best way to do this, which side of the bow and whether to rest the arrow on one's knuckles or one's thumb. Vasco had never bothered to argue. His father had been a good archer, though he never shot an arrow in anger. And he had taught his son the only good way to do it. Vasco's arrows shot from the right side of the bow, over his thumb. He reached for the one of the arrows in the earth at his feet, and knocked it. There was no wind in the clearing where Coon's cottage lay. Not for the first time, he wondered whether it was luck or if she was a witch. Neither would surprise him. If she was a witch though, all the more reason not to wake her before she chose to rise. Draw. Vasco sucked in a breath, held it and drew the arrow back a little. The bowstring pulled as smoothly as a song. 
He sighted along the arrow, aiming for the target, as he drew the arrow back further. Breathe, he told himself. There was nothing else in the clearing but him, his bow and arrow, the target he intended to hit, and the air separating him and his goal. Ere he had to breathe. 1.23 Vasco loosed his arrow at the target. It hit, but barely. He had aimed too low. Again. Vasco reached for another arrow. It sped off into the trees, missing the target completely. Vasco swore under his breath. Again. By the time Kuhn called him for breakfast, he had run through his store of arrows three times, but on the third round, he'd managed to hit the target on every shot. Tomorrow he would do better, he promised himself. If he did not, better to give Kuhn the bow for firewood, than carry it around any longer. His father's bow was the only thing he'd salvaged from his burnt home. That and the goats, of course. His father had kept the weapon in the woodshed, the only building in the village that hadn't burned. Perhaps because it was full of green wood, not yet dry enough to burn, that Vasco and his father had cut the week before the attack. To burn it would be to lose the last link to home. To his family. To Dokia. Though they all walked with the ancestors now, he would carry their memories with him every day. And his father's bow. If you don't come in now, I shall give it to the goats. Kuhn threatened. A very real threat, Vasco knew. He'd let the goats out of the barn to munch on the fresh spring grass for breakfast, but they wouldn't turn their noses up at human food. He hurried to obey her summons. Tomorrow he swore. Though to who he wasn't sure. 15. After waiting most of the afternoon, during which the muscled man still didn't leave, Bianca reluctantly climbed back on her horse and headed home. It wasn't until she reached the palace that she realized she hadn't given Kuhn any of the food. Tomorrow she promised herself, for the man would have gone home by then, surely. Yet when she returned on the morrow, he was still there, cutting trees and dragging them back to the cottage. He looked bigger and brawnier than she remembered, which only made her feel worse about forgetting to give Kuhn her basket the previous day. So today she watched and waited, telling herself she was looking for an opportunity to sneak into the cottage unseen so she could repay Kuhn for her kindness. Once again, the man did not leave the yard for long enough. He had enough timber to keep him occupied well into the afternoon, when Bianca had to return home. Every day for a week she returned, and every day she found him still there. She wanted to resent him for keeping her from meeting Kuhn, but she couldn't. He took such care in his work, cutting the timber so precisely before using it to build Kuhn a completely new barn. Only when it was finished did she see him smile, and what a change it was. The brooding man seemed to light up from the inside. He took pride in a job well done. Something she had rarely seen in her father's palace, where servants held their positions for life and had no need to be good at their jobs to keep them. Oh she'd seen musicians dedicated to their craft and cooks who cared about what their kitchen created, though the staff under them might not be quite as enthusiastic about such exacting standards, but this? The way this man built that tiny structure to house Kuhn's goats made her wonder how the architects and builders of the palace in the capital had felt when they regarded their handiwork. She would never know, for the palace was completed before she was born, and definitely before she discovered she could use her invisible talents to escape the harem and roam about the palace. She fancied that she was the only princess who had ever entered the kitchens and watched the soldiers at training in the guardhouse yard, when neither was deemed a fitting place for the king's daughters. She could have watched the scribes and calligraphers for hours though, for their painstaking work was akin to art. Only the knowledge that her mother would miss her and know she had escaped, sent her back. Otherwise, Bianca fancied she might have joined them. If she had not been born a princess, she would have liked to choose the life of a scribe. Locking up words and whole stories in a series of symbols, so that people miles away or a hundred years into the future could see them and know what had happened. It was a kind of immortality, she supposed. 
Now if she could immortalize Kuhn's carpenter in art, capturing the bulge of his muscles as he hefted the axe, or lifted a new beam into place, or that look of calm concentration he wore when he practiced archery in the early mornings. She'd only caught him at it once but his makeshift target, a round slice of tree trunk, bore the signs of increasing accuracy as the week progressed. She imagined him returning home to his lovely, loving wife, for a man like this could not go unloved, carrying fresh meat he'd caught on the point of his arrow on the way home after finishing work on Coon's cottage. His own cottage would be immaculate inside and out, for a man who took such care on Coon's house would lavish even more attention on the home of the woman he loved. And at night, beneath that perfectly crafted roof, he would use those skilled hands on his wife, in all the ways they'd whispered about in the harem. Bianca sighed at the thought. She envied the man's wife, for she knew a joy Bianca herself would never know. Movement sighted out of the corner of her eye roused Bianca from her daydream, and she sat up to find Kuhn's eyes on her. The old woman beckoned her over, as if she could see the invisible princess as clearly as anything else in her garden. Bianca glanced around, not seeing the man, so she dismissed the spell and hurried into the house. You've been so busy watching Vasco that you've forgotten about me, Kuhn remarked as she set some water boiling for tea. Bianca opened her mouth to protest, but the old woman's sharp look silenced her. Instead she said, how did you know? I recognize the smell of your magic now, having seen you cast it so often. There is more to this world than what the eyes can see, Kuhn said. Though you've been using your eyes more of late, I see. What sort of spell did he ask for, to repay you with a beautiful new barn? Bianca asked. It must be something difficult. Healing for his wife perhaps? The man she'd watched all week would do anything to make his wife well if she fell ill, Bianca was certain of it. Kuhn laughed. Not all want a spell. And not all men have wives. This one shares a bed with my nanny goats every night, which might be why he built me such a stout barn. He is a soldier, injured in battle, who now wanders while he looks for work. He had thoughts to apply at the summer palace. Bianca's hopes, which had soared at the thought that the man had no wife yet, plummeted to earth at the realization that he was another adventurer. So he will appear at our table next, swathed in ill-fitting silk, as he tries to wheedle secrets out of my sisters? He had thoughts to work as a guard, but I have kept him busy here. He's not like the others. The others barely had two words for me before they hustled themselves up to the palace. Vasco is a good man who has no wish for fame and wealth. Not like the others, who would thrust a blade through my body without a second thought if the reward asked for my heart and not the palace secret. Bianca wet her lips. So he does not want a bride or a palace? Kuhn's forehead furrowed, then smoothed. He is a man who keeps his feet solidly on the ground, who might look at the stars above but will never reach for them. A man who happily shares a barn with goats knows a palace and a princess are far beyond his reach. What if he had help? The words left Bianca's lips before she'd really thought them through. Kuhn eyed her suspiciously. Are you offering to help a man you do not know, and betray your sisters in the same breath? Bianca gaped. She a traitor? Never. I meant, if you mentioned the king's offer and told Vasco what you know of the mystery so that he might have a better chance than his predecessors, and maybe encouraged him to try. Do you know what happens to the men who fail to solve the mystery? Kuhn demanded. They have three days. If they fail they leave, Bianca said. Have you ever seen them leave? Bianca shook her head. No but they must. They are no longer at the palace. Are they? Kuhn's eyes were sharp. There are many cellars beneath the summer palace, much like its grander cousin in the capital. It would be easy to turn one into a dungeon to imprison them. But why? What would F.A. have to gain in imprisoning such men? I don't know how you could imagine such nonsense. Even as she said the words, Bianca didn't believe them. For under her bed, she still had the first adventurer's sword. 
No man would leave without his sword, the means to defend himself. Yet, dot why would anyone imprison the man? He had committed no crime. But the sword. Kuhn's look was knowing. Ah, you suspect there is more than nonsense in it. I see it in your eyes. Why should I throw a good man to the wolves? It seems to me he can do a lot more good in his life than try to solve some mystery not even the king knows the answer to. Have you solved it yet? Bianca forced herself to admit that she had not. Vasco, if that was indeed the man's name, had distracted her from asking her sisters about it. But if she asked them, I could help him, she offered eagerly before adding, not to betray my sisters. But to stop the flow of beggars and braggarts, F.A. sends to our table. It is not right. He dresses them like noblemen, but beneath the veneer, I fear that they have few principles. It is only a matter of time before one of them threatens us with violence, or invades our sleeping chamber at night, or... Bianca shuddered. She didn't want to think of anything worse, but the images crept to her mind, unbidden. She had heard stories of the things men did to unprotected women. There was a reason she hadn't left the palace grounds alone. If you help him the man may stand a chance, Kuhn admitted. But you will rob me of my servant, before he has fashioned a complete new cottage and furnishings for me. A project he seems to enjoy. It will take all my powers of persuasion to make him believe he wants to leave my employ, for the uncertainty of a job at the palace. It will cost you more than a basket of food this time, princess. Bianca recognized the steely look in Kuhn's eyes. That very same look had made her climb on the cottage roof to see her own handiwork. Very well, she said. What would you ask of me in payment for such a service? Kuhn shook her head. You would not last a day in a village marketplace, let alone the wide world, girl. You should offer a very low price, not let me name mine. That isn't how bargaining is done. Bianca's lips lifted in a smile she did not feel. I cut my teeth on politics. The bargaining at court is very different to a common marketplace. Both parties ask for all that they desire, before negotiations commence to whittle down the lists to some sort of compromise where neither are happy, but each gets some of what they wish for. Name your price and then we shall bargain in earnest. Kuhn's eyes widened. Perhaps she had underestimated Bianca, the girl mused. She wagered the witch did not make that mistake often. A new cloak that is so beautiful, so stunning that no man can look at its wearer and truly see them, but nothing is hidden to the wearer. Bianca nodded slowly. You wish me to make you a cloak which will render you invisible, yet able to see the invisible, like I do. Your quick girl. Would you like a cloak made of silk, wool or something else? Bianca asked. Kuhn looked thoughtful. Silk seems a little too grand. And besides, I already have the cloak. It is your magic I want. Her gnarled finger pointed at the hooks behind the door. Beside her own faded, worn cloak in earthy brown hung another one, much longer and thicker than the first. Dark as a raven's wing, the blackness of it seemed to steal some of the room's light. It almost seemed alive, for it certainly held its own magic. If Bianca bespelled it so that it made the wearer invisible, it would be a valuable thing indeed. We have a bargain, Bianca announced. I will cast an invisibility spell on that cloak that also works on its owner, and you shall send your servant to the palace to solve my mystery. Kuhn eyed her. Most would hesitate before making a bargain with a witch girl. Are you sure? Bianca almost laughed. But we are both witches, and you are the one asking me for a spell in exchange for a trivial favor. Shouldn't I be asking you if you are sure? Kuhn seemed to consider for a moment, before she nodded. We have a bargain. Cast your spell, and the man will be at the Summer Palace on the morrow. The spell was surprisingly simple, shimmering across the cloth like so many stars. Yet when Kuhn donned the cloak, it hid her completely. 
That will do, Kuhn said, appearing again as she shrugged off the cloak, which was so long it pulled in the floor around her. Outside, the rhythmic blows of an axe biting into wood pierced the stillness. Good to hear him hard at work, Kuhn said, jerking her chin in the direction of the yard. Tomorrow. You promised, Bianca said, feeling her heart beating fast. It must be the surprise at hearing axe blows, she told herself. Not the prospect of sharing the summer palace with Vasco. Why she barely knew the man. I will hold up my end of the bargain. Ancestors help him if you don't keep up yours though. He will need all the help he can get, Kuhn replied. I'm sure he'll succeed where the others failed, Bianca said, trying to sound more confident than she felt. He had to. Summoning a satisfied smile, she strode out of the cottage, covered her fair skin from the sun, and rode home. That night she could scarcely sleep from excitement. But finally she did, only to dream of ravens wheeling in a sky of invisible stars. 16. This time when Vasco climbed down from the roof, he felt the weariness of the long day's work. But a good day's work. A good week's work, truth be told. He had repaired walls, replaced beams, and Kuhn's cottage now had a completely new roof. She also had a year's worth of firewood, the remains of the trees Vasco had cut down which had been suitable for nothing but burning. And yes, he'd chopped that into suitable lengths for her too. He hadn't quite shaken that prickly feeling of being watched, but he'd learned to ignore it. Kuhn spent most of her time in her cottage, not outside it watching him, and as he'd seen no one else, he concluded that his watchers must be birds. For what novelty could there be in a man rebuilding a house, except for the woman who lived there? He paused to wash his face in the water butt, and only then did he hear voices. He listened hard, for more than once he had heard Kuhn talking to herself. No, this was definitely two voices and only one of them was Kuhn's. The visitor must have arrived while he'd been working on the roof, too busy to notice her arrival. Not wishing to disturb Kuhn and her visitor, he peeped through the window. Kuhn sat at the table pouring tea, but the visitor had her back to the window. In the dimly lit cottage, all he could see of the visitor was her white hair, carefully braided into one long queue that hung down her back contrasting with her dark cloak. Another old woman, he concluded. He debated whether to go and introduce himself, in the hope that Kuhn's friend might have more work to keep him busy for another week or two. For Kuhn could not complain about his diligence or even his appetite. Vasco was a hard worker and he knew it. Perhaps it would be better to demonstrate that to the guest, rather than going into the cottage and interrupting their conversation. He headed to the chopping block, where there were still some logs uncut. He had planned to leave them for the morrow, but he was not so tired that he could not cut them now. Levering the axe out of the chopping block where he'd left it that morning, he set to work. Vasco soon fell into a rhythm, turning one log into suitable pieces for an old woman to carry, before chipping a pile of kindling. He piled his handiwork up in the woodshed before starting on the next. When the door opened and Kuhn's visitor emerged, Vasco almost dropped his axe in surprise. In the bright sunlight her hair appeared a pale gold, not white at all. She moved like a much younger woman than Kuhn, with her straight back and a pert toss of her head as she stepped out fully. When Vasco saw her face, the axe fell from his nerveless fingers. This time he didn't notice. He had eyes only for the fair maiden before him. He had never seen a girl with such fair skin, paler even than her hair. Pink lips and bright eyes, separated by a small pointed nose, and all lit up with a satisfied smile. A smile that would haunt his dreams for the rest of his life, he was certain. He had only a moment more to stare at the vision before him, before she pulled her hood up, and her face vanished from sight in the depths of her cloak. She mounted a horse Vasco had not seen until now, waved a pale hand at Kuhn, before urging her mount into a trot. The moment she disappeared through the trees, Vasco felt the most powerful sense of loss. It was almost like losing his village all over again. Put your eyes back in your sockets boy, Kuhn snapped. You look like a fool who has never seen a pretty girl before. Vasco found his voice. 
I have seen pretty girls before, he said slowly. But never a creature as beautiful as her. He swallowed. Who is she? Kuhn cackled. That is Princess Bianca. She paused as if to let her statement sink in before she continued. She is one of the king's daughters who lives at the Summer Palace. She is kind enough to come and visit an old lady and bring me supplies from the palace kitchens. She eyed him speculatively. But the princess has not come to visit me since you arrived, perhaps scared away by the hulking brute of a soldier. A pity, for you have not tasted palace food. As it is, I was running low on well nigh everything until she arrived. Vasco hung his head. If I have outstayed my welcome, then I shall depart. Your house is repaired as promised, and I hope I have earned my board and lodging. If you know of anywhere else I might be of service. Kuhn waved him into silence. Don't be silly boy. If you had eaten every crumb in my larder, it would be a good bargain for the new house and barn you have built for me. And I might be able to suggest further employment for you, especially if you are interested in seeing the princess again. Vasco was afraid to meet her eyes. I would dearly love to see such beauty again, but I fear she is too high for me. Just a glimpse will leave me distracted from my work all day. He cleared his throat. I had thought to ask at the palace whether they have need of more guards, but now I am certain of it. A palace that keeps such treasures as that princess within its walls can never have enough guards. Kuhn smiled faintly. I don't know about guards, but I do know of one problem the king has with keeping so many princesses in the palace. He has a mystery he wants solved. And any man who can solve this for him will be richly rewarded. Will the king provide a lowly soldier with a bed and a meal while he solves this mystery? Vasco asked. Kuhn laughed. I believe so. Then what can you tell me about this mystery? Vasco asked. Kuhn raised her eyebrows. You ask about the mystery and not the reward? You are a strange man. Vasco shrugged. There is no reward unless I can solve the mystery. And if I have a place to eat and sleep, I have little else to worry about. Then come inside, for royal mysteries are best discussed over tea and cakes from the palace kitchens. Kuhn beckoned him inside, and Vasco followed. 17. Bianca paced along the lakeshore while she waited impatiently for her sisters to wake, or for Vasco to arrive. She hadn't cared about any of the previous adventurers, but she wanted to speak to him. To see if he truly was different from the others, like Kuhn had said. The sun had already started to sink by the time a maid finally came to tell her that her sisters were awake. Bianca thanked the girl, then added, Do you know if any visitors have arrived? The girl frowned and shook her head. No mistress. Surely Kuhn wouldn't have broken her bargain, would she? They had a deal. A bargain between two witches wasn't to be broken lightly, Bianca knew. But the day wasn't over yet. Perhaps Kuhn had kept Vasco for one more day to finish working on her roof, and he needed daylight to work. It might be dark by the time her arrived at the palace, if there was a lot of work to do. In the meantime, she would find out all she could from her sisters, Bianca decided. She headed inside and found her sisters seated in the dining hall, breaking their fast, though it was well into the afternoon. Bianca slid into an empty spot on the bench. Good day, she began. A chorus of mumbled responses came back to her. Bianca hid a smile. They really had just awoken. I've been wondering for a while now, and I must ask. Why the pile of shoes at the door every morning? I have lost count of the number of times I have tripped over them. A few of the girls shared smiles, and Brenna laughed. She set her dog down on the floor with a bowl of food she'd selected from the table for the animal. You mean the shoes we have all danced to pieces? Bianca nodded. They do look quite worn. I wonder why you would keep shoes in such a state. Hazel laughed. 
We don't keep them. We pile them up so that the servants can throw them on the refuse heap, and cousin F.A. will have new shoes made to replace them. He's been sending up new shoes for you, though you haven't danced at all since you arrived. I don't dance, Bianca said, ducking her head. She reached for a piece of bread. But you must, Aruna exclaimed. Tonight, you will come with us. I promise you, you will feel like the most graceful dancer in the world once you have the right partner. A vision of Vasco popped into Bianca's head, and she blushed. The right partner, she echoed, trying to rid her mind of the thought of Vasco holding her in his arms. Oh yes, Nera gushed. Just wait until you see. A masculine cough interrupted her. All the girls fell silent. F.A. stepped into the room with a simpering smile on his face. My dear princesses, may I present Lord Vasco? Lord Vasco? Bianca choked. 18. Princesses who dance their shoes to pieces? And a king who was so insistent upon knowing why that he would hire a man just to solve the mystery of the worn shoes? Even as Vasco trudged up the road to the palace, away from the comfort of Kuhn's cottage, he shook his head in disbelief. He had seen the town of shoemakers, so he knew there was some truth in these princesses who wore out shoes faster than a soldier wore out boots, but there had to be more to this mystery than first appeared. Why else would Kuhn have given him so much advice? She told him to refuse any food or wine that the princesses themselves did not consume. If he wanted to know what the girls did at night, he must enter their bedchamber before the door was locked, as though he dared enter a princess's bedchamber. Yet she told him to hide there and wear the new cloak she'd given him, as though the black wall would conceal him completely in what would surely be a well-lit chamber. And to top it all off, she'd said he only had three days in which to solve the mystery, so if he ran into difficulties, he was to approach Princess Bianca, the pale beauty he'd espied at Coon's cottage, and ask her for help. As if such a highborn princess would stoop to assist someone as worthless as him. But Coon had insisted, and he had repeated all of her advice, until she was satisfied that he remembered it all. Still, he didn't trust what he'd heard, so instead of approaching the front entrance as Kuhn had told him to, Vasco skirted the building until he found the servant's entrance and knocked there instead. The maid who answered the door wore a dress far finer than anything the women in Vasco's village had ever owned. For a moment, his voice died in his throat, as he wondered if he'd somehow arrived at a private entrance to the princess's quarters instead. Vasco's hands tightened around the hat he held level with his belt. I came seeking work, and an old woman down the road told me the master of this house might have need of a man. The girl's eyes held sympathy as she shook her head. There is no position here that I know of. We are but a small household. I don't know why Mistress Coon would send you here. She of all people knows. She swallowed. Unless she sent you here to solve the mystery? Vasco gave a nod. She did mention a mystery. Are you sure? the girl asked. You will only have three days and no one else has managed to solve it in that time. You aren't like the others. The others being princes and lords, noblemen who were accustomed to being in the presence of princesses, Vasco assumed. Not common soldiers like him. Yet Kuhn had been confident he could do this thing. I must try, he said finally. I have nothing else. No home, no family and nothing to occupy me once the army had finished with me. Unless you can point me to somewhere else where I might find work, this is the only employment for miles around. Now she looked almost pitying. I understand. What is your name, soldier? Vasco, he answered. I'm Geral, she said. I will tell the Lord Steward you are here. If there is no other suitor, he will introduce you to the princesses and you will be in their company for three days until you solve the mystery or are banished from this place. But, if you wish for company or more plain fare than is served in the dining hall, or if the Lord Steward will not see you, I pray you will come to the kitchen. There will be a place for you at our table, 
for anyone who can tell us about what goes on outside the estate, is welcome. We are very isolated here. As isolated as his own village before it was wiped out, Vasco thought, though he couldn't bring himself to say the words aloud. Not to this pretty maid who had probably never seen any sort of violence in her life, much like the princesses she served. Geralt deserved to marry one of the manservants of the house and live in the shelter of such a great house, birthing babies who would grow to replace her in service once they were old enough. A life, a home and a living, with parents who would live until old age with such security. What more could anyone ask for? It was more than Vasco could ever expect now, he told himself. A quick glance told him Geralt was still waiting for an answer. Tell the Lord Steward I seek work. If he turns me away, then I will gladly enjoy your hospitality for a night, and tell you all I know of battles in the borderlands. He would have to censor his tale and make the men sound more heroic than they truly were, he knew, but it wouldn't be the first time. No one wanted to hear stories of blood and death and tragedy, tainted by the darkness in his own head. If it would fill his belly for a night and perhaps the next day, he would spin tales of heroes so that those who had died in blood and pain might be remembered as more than they were in life. Perhaps it would even ease the spirits of those he had fought with, only to lose them to a stray arrow or well-placed spear. Geralt pushed the door open wider and beckoned him in. Come sit in the kitchen while you wait. Serena, the cook, will make you some tea and maybe spare you a cake before they are sent up to the dining hall for the princesses. To his surprise, Serena soon had him ensconced on a seat by the fire, tea in one hand and cake in the other. Vasco hoped that Geralt was wrong and there would be a place for him in this household. He hadn't seen a single guard yet, and he didn't understand it. Surely princesses needed protection. The Lord Steward will see you now, Carol said. Vasco hurried to swallow his mouthful of cake. Are you sure? She nodded, her eyes on the flagstones at her feet, as she led him out of the kitchen and into the house proper. Tapestries lined the passageways, the colors increasingly vibrant, until they reached a richly carved door. Carol knocked, then pushed the door open. The man you sent for, my lord, she said, gesturing for Vasco to enter. The moment Vasco's worn boots touched the carpet inside the room, Geralt closed the door quietly behind him. The lord steward sat in a throne-like chair raised up on a dais facing the door. Almost like a king, though the man's bald head bore no crown. His clothes were a mix of scarlet, purple and yellow silk, an eye-watering combination in any light, let alone a chamber filled with lit torches. What makes you think you can solve the mystery not even the king can solve? The man asked. Vasco bowed low, racking his brain for an answer that would satisfy the man. Something in Geralt's words struck him. I am different to the others, he said. The Lord Steward snorted. Very well. You have three days to bring me a solution, or you die. I will present you to the princesses and... Three days or die. Vasco blurted out. Kuhn had neglected to mention this part. And yet. Since the day his village burned, he had gambled his life in every battle. At the end of each fighting day, either he or his enemies would lie on the battlefield to be food for crows. As a guard, he would need to be willing to lay down his life to defend his master and the master's family. How was this any different? The Lord Steward made an impatient noise in his throat. If I do not believe you are doing your best to uncover the mystery, it could be less than three days. My primary care is for the princesses, and if I hear a whisper of any untoward behavior, or that you are wasting my time, your time will be up. He rose to his feet, smirking as though he liked the way he towered over Vasco from his high platform. So, are you wasting my time now, or do you wish to meet the princesses? At one word from me, I can have you executed before you can draw breath to protest. Vasco had no choice. At least his body would not become food for crows, and his death would be quick. Small comfort if he failed, but he did not mean to. I would be honored if you would present me to the ladies of the house, he said. 
The man clapped his hands. Excellent. But first, you must dress properly. The princesses will not allow you anywhere near them looking like some peasant. When Geralt cracked open the door, the Lord Steward said, take him to the guest dressing room and see that he is dressed. Hoping he wouldn't have to wear the same garish colors as the Lord Steward, Vasco followed Geralt out. 19. The other girls didn't even glance up from their dinner, but Bianca couldn't tear her eyes away from the man who stepped into the room. Her fingers itched to stroke his black silk tunic. It certainly wasn't made for him. The sleeves that would have been loose on any other man bulged with the muscles she'd seen in Coon's yard, making them look even bigger. He'd had to unlace it a little down the front to allow space for his broad chest without ripping the fabric, but the tantalizing glimpse of flesh at his throat only made her mouth dry at the thought of touching, kissing, stroking. Bianca mentally shook herself. If cousin F.A. had brought him here, dressed up like the Lord she knew he wasn't, then he had a mystery to solve. She patted the bench beside her, shifting over until her foot nudged the dog's furry body. Come sit by me, Lord Vasco, she said, surprising herself with the low purr that came out of her throat. Vasco looked even more startled. I, I can't, he mumbled, backing away. Cousin F.A. screwed his face up in annoyance. Why not? The princess gave you an order. Vasco bowed deeply. I am no lord princess. I am just a common soldier, not worthy to share your table. Even the honor of sitting at your feet is more than I deserve. Bianca couldn't help it. She laughed. The place at my feet is taken by a dog. I'm afraid you must make do with the bench. We are not in the capital now, and the accommodations here at the Summer Palace are more informal. Her sisters were staring at her and she felt blood rush to her cheeks. Please sit here. She lowered her gaze until the other girls turned their attention back to their food. Evidently they hadn't noticed anything different about Vasco. They must be blind, she decided. Vasco slid easily into the spot beside Bianca, who found her breath caught in her throat now he sat so close. Why his thigh brushed her skirt, and if she moved her own leg just the slightest bit, she would be able to feel him through the fabric. I'll fetch you some wine, Hazel said, rising. Bianca saw the reproach in her sister's gaze, after all, she was the newest to arrive, which meant she was the one who was supposed to head down to the cellar for their guest's wine, but Hazel was gone before Bianca could apologize. Probably for the best, Bianca told herself. After all, what would Hazel say if her only excuse was that she was too busy admiring the man Cousin F.A. had thrust among them? Hazel would think her mad. Perhaps she'd be right too. She glanced at Vasco. He sat silent and motionless, not touching a crumb of the food that covered the table, as if he was somehow afraid of it. Eat something, Bianca said, offering him the nearest platter. He bowed his head. You first, princess. Of course. She outranked him, something she'd forgotten in sharing a table with her sisters and the mannerless men who had come and gone. She seized the nearest thing and took a bite, not really tasting it. Only then did Vasco take food for himself. He ate in silence, his head down as though he wished he were invisible. Bianca understood the feeling, though not the reason for it. He seemed terribly uncomfortable. Where are you from, sir? she asked. He swallowed. Nowhere. She managed to smile. No one is from nowhere. Why, we are all born somewhere, even if we no longer live there. Where were you born? I was born in a small village that no longer exists. Raised to the ground by an advancing army. Or a retreating one. I am not sure. Heedless of those who lived there. So the village where I was born is no more and nowhere. His voice sounded so dead, like the village itself. What happened to those who lived there, she asked. They died. So final. And yet. 
Hazel appeared with a jug of wine in hand, which she poured into Vasco's cup. He seized it and drank down the contents before holding the cup out for more. But you survived, Bianca began eagerly. I imagine that must be a thrilling tale. The eyes he turned to her were dark and haunted. Bianca's smile died on her lips and Hazel gave a cry of alarm. Somehow the whole jug of wine had slipped from her hand and smashed on the floor. The shards lay in a spreading lake beneath the table. I am sorry, Vasco said, rising. He bowed abruptly, then hurried out. Bianca tried to follow him, but Brenna's dog tangled itself in her skirts in its hurry to reach the spilled wine, and by the time she managed to clamber to her feet, Vasco had vanished. Good riddance, Aruna said. You can do much better, sister. And you will tonight. Hazel seized her hand. You must dance with us. I won't let you retire early. Not with that man about. He did not drink enough of the strong wine to sleep the night through. We'll take him another jug on our way to bed. 20. The sweet princess with the expressive eyes just wouldn't give up. Again and again, she asked him about his home until he wanted to scream the truth for all of them to hear. The village bathed in blood, the smell of burned bodies and dokia, dokia. Vasco downed his wine and pushed away from the table. He staggered out of the room, clamping his mouth shut to keep the horrors in. Like Geralt she did not need his nightmares. They were his alone. Speaking of nightmares, it was time to give in to his once more. He'd worked hard all day before walking up to the palace, and he could scarcely keep his eyes open. But he didn't know where his bed might be, if he even had one. Vasco headed for the kitchen. Surely someone there would know where he was billeted. He met Geralt on her way back to the kitchen, carrying a tray of half-eaten food. Serving the Lord Steward, he asked, nodding at the scraps. She nodded. He takes his meals in his rooms. Too good for the company of princesses? Vasco said. Geralt reddened. Actually, I believe they refuse to eat with him. The Lord Steward is not well liked. She pressed her lips together, as if she wished she could unsay her words. What about the princesses? Are they well liked? Geralt managed a nervous smile. They are princesses. The king's beautiful daughters. You can't help but admire them, even if we see them so little. They spend most of their time abed, but when they are awake, they are not unkind. Not unkind. What a thing to say about someone, let alone her mistresses. Better than not well liked though. What of the pale one who is fairer than the others, he demanded. The princess Bianca. She is our most recent arrival, only a few weeks ago. Geralt's expression brightened. But I have seen more of her than her sisters combined. They sleep while she rises early. Sometimes, she even enters the kitchen to ask for things. The way she speaks to you, looking in your eyes like she really sees you and not just some invisible servant to be ordered about. Such a small thing, but it truly sets her apart from the others. She likes to ride or walk down by the lake, and she takes a basket of provisions with her so she can stay out of the house for longer. Remembering the time he'd seen her at Coon's cottage, Vasco asked, where does she ride to? Geralt shrugged. Wherever she pleases, I am sure. She is a princess, and all the land around belongs to her father, the king. Who would dare stop her? Who indeed? Do you know anything about this mystery with the shoes? He said. Geralt shook her head. No more than you. That is why you sleep in the maid's room off their bedchamber and not one of us. He had a place to sleep. Vasco grasped at the idea. Can you show me where? He asked urgently. Of course. I have already placed your things there. You left them in the kitchen. Geralt glanced down. Let me just take this tray to the kitchen, and I will show you up. Geralt returned a moment later, beckoning Vasco to follow her. 
Tapestries lined the walls here too, but they were not as grand as the ones outside the Lord Steward's rooms. They looked too old and faded to be the princess's own work. The decor didn't improve when they entered the princess's receiving chamber. If anything, the walls were even more bare here, for the room held only a few benches and little else. The girls did not spend much time here. Gerald gestured toward an open door at the other end of the chamber. This new room was full of beds, a dozen to be precise. All the princesses slept in the same room, which had a row of small windows, but only the one door in or out. Perhaps they danced around their audience chamber, and that's why there was no furniture to speak of. Mystery solved. Your bed is there. Gerald pointed at an alcove just outside the door to the princess's bedchamber. It contained a straw pallet and some hooks that now held his meager belongings. You have the most beautiful cloak. Vasco glanced at Kuhn's gift. In truth, the thick black wool was better quality than anything he'd ever owned, but much like tonight's fancy clothes, he hadn't been able to refuse it. He didn't have to sleep in silk though. But Gerald should go before he undressed. I wish to retire now, he said. It took Gerald a moment before she understood. Then she colored. Of course. In the morning, when you wish to break your fast, come down to the kitchen. We have orders to serve you in the dining chamber with the princesses, but they rise so late that you might wish for something earlier. She bobbed on the spot, as if she'd almost curtsied to him before remembering she didn't need to, and hurried off. Vasco peeled off the black silk fripperies the Lord Steward had made him wear and donned one of his own worn tunics. Much more comfortable, he stretched out on his bed and almost instantly fell asleep. 21. While Bianca's sisters headed for their bedchamber, she dutifully made her way down to the cellar for another jug of wine. On her way back up, she returned to the dining hall to grab Vasco's cup from the table. She peered under the table, wondering what to do about the puddle of wine. She decided to leave it for one of the servants to deal with. After all, someone would come to clear the table of the remains of their meal. Most of the wine was gone, sunk between the flagstones or, more likely, lapped up by the little dog that now slept under the table in the puddle that remained. Bianca smiled. Brenna's dog would probably sleep there all night. Wine jug in one hand, cup in the other, she made her way to her bedchamber. F.A. waited outside, looking irritable. Hurry up. I must lock the door, he said, waving her in. Lock the door? Bianca had never seen him do such a thing before. She stepped into the audience chamber, then turned to ask F.A. what he meant by it. He slammed the door shut in her face and she heard the sounds of a bolt being drawn across it effectively locking them all in. Including Vasco, she realized, who now slept soundly on the pallet beside their bedchamber door. No wine necessary. Nevertheless, she set the cup and jug down beside his bed. Staring at the snoring soldier, she suddenly felt very tired herself. Probably because she'd slept so little the previous night. Maybe she should climb into bed and sleep the night away. Her sister's shoe mystery could wait for another night. Hurry up and dress, or we shall be late. Nera hissed, tugging on Bianca's arm. She allowed herself to be pulled into the bedchamber. Brenna closed the door behind her. All the other girls were in various stages of dressing not for bed, but for what appeared to be a royal ball. Well, if they were going to dance, she thought wryly, why not? They might be exiled from the palace and the capital, but they could still dress like they were attending court. Now, more than ever, she felt too tired to join them. Hurry! Nero repeated as Hazel helped her lace up her gown. Bianca shook her head. I am too tired. Tomorrow night, maybe. I can scarcely keep my eyes open. Nero made an exasperated noise. Sleep then. We'll choose the handsomest and you'll have to make do with what is left. Unless you prefer the fool outside? She tittered and the other girls joined in. And what if she did? 
Bianca wanted to say, but she held her tongue. They were locked in their own bedchamber, with no men, handsome or otherwise. She stripped down to her shift, and climbed beneath the covers of her bed. Almost as soon as her head touched the pillow, she drifted off into dreams. What seemed like only a moment later, she was roused by the sound of hammering on her bedchamber door.